Dear friends, we are already God's children. We don't have to press on to the mark of the prize to become God's children. We become God's children the day, that moment, that we ask Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. That instant, He takes the death and the darkness out of you. He puts His life in you, and you're His son. You're His daughter. So it says here, we are ready. We are already God's children. But He has not yet shown us what what we will be like when Christ appears. But we know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation, they will keep themselves pure even as he is pure. Romans 8, 29. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. The New King James says, to be conformed to the image of Jesus. So that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren. Let me make it really clear. Most of Word of Life could probably teach this message. That means that we've done our job, haven't we? It is who we are. But let me make it clear to all who will hear, whether you're a new member here, or a visitor, or whether you're watching on, on video, Let me make it really clear. The high calling is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ here on this earth. That's what it is. The high calling. Nothing higher. This one thing I do. It is the top. It is in a category of itself. It is the reason why God apprehended each and every one of us. He didn't come out and grab us, call us, take us out of a pit just so we could go to heaven when we die. He didn't do it just so we could come to church on Sundays. He didn't do it just to clean up our lives. He did it so he could put his life in us and so we could manifest his life to the world to be the manifested sons of God. And they don't need manifested sons of God in heaven. They need him him right here. That's why we were apprehended. And that is what we need to reach out and get a hold of. The high calling is to be completely conformed to Jesus here on this earth. Many will say, but my calling is is the prophetic. That's good. Or or my calling... I'm called to be a missionary. I'm called to be a pastor. I'm called to be a teacher. I'm called to the marketplace. These are all valid callings. This is good. But the high calling is different than that. It is more than that. The high calling is not instead of your individual callings. It's beyond your individual callings. The high calling is the result of the body of Christ functioning in their individual callings. I'll say that again. The high calling is the thing that happens to us as a result of each and every one of us, that which every joint supplies, each and every one of us doing what we've been called to do as a body of Christ. All right, so now that we know what the high calling is. Now that we know that it is the uh, number one priority, we need to make sure that everything we do in our individual lives, our individual callings, we need to make sure that everything we do is contributory to our high calling. That it's in alignment with our number one priority. Probably one of the greatest casualties in the Christian church today with the awakening of the supernatural powers of the Holy Spirit, with the awakening of the prophetic, with the awakening of the fivefold ministries, is everybody's got their ministry. This is my ministry. 
That crazy pastor is getting in the way with my ministry. They're limiting what I'm called to do. They're hindering me. They're holding me back. There's a whole lot of me involved in that, isn't there? When each and every individual calling and gift is not for the me, it's for the we. It's for the body of Christ so that we can grow unto a fullness of the measure of the stature of Jesus, the high calling. Are you called to be in the five-fold ministry? Fantastic. That will indeed and rightfully so consume a large part of your resources, your time. But it is not the high calling. Your high calling is to be like Jesus. And a, as a teacher, through apostle, your job is to promote and to facilitate the high calling in everybody else's life. If your ministry is prospering and everybody around you is suffering, are you called to the gifts of the Spirit? Yeah, yeah, great. This will and indeed should take a great deal of your time, but it's not your high calling. You should be moving in the Spirit, moving in the supernatural, but it's also that you can facilitate and you can empower the people around you so that we all can become like Jesus. In the marketplace, in business, you in government, you in ministry of any sort, that's great. Do it. But recognize it's number two on the list of priorities. And what's the high calling? To be like Jesus. Anybody, anybody see... Um, God Think TV last Wednesday came out. Is that all? Come on, you guys. You're a little better than that, yeah. Well, Bob, Bob made mention of something that whenever I travel and I, I, I go up you know, and speak or whatever the case might be, uh, people will come looking for me and they're generally going to find me not with the pastors and not with the bishop. They're going to generally find me with the worship leaders. I used to be a worship leader. I'm still a worshiper, right? Yeah. They, the, the, the new worship team kind of passed me in, in the passing lane, right? But I'm still a worshiper. You know, I, like, I relate to the worshipers. You know why? Because it's permanent work. It's a full-time permanent job. See, I've been called to be a five-fold teacher. I, I kind of do that from time to time. I've been called to be a five-fold pastor. I've been called other of these five-fold ministries, Right? But I don't relate to that. You know why? It's temporary work. Oh, it's full time. But see, once the high calling is accomplished, once the people of God have begun to manifest this life of Jesus, once perfection has been relieved, I get laid off. Because it says in Ephesians 4 that the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher they're there for the work of the ministry, for perfecting the saint, for the building of the body of Christ until, until we all come in the unity of the faith, in the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man. And when that happens, I get laid off. But the worshipers continue to worship forever and ever and ever. So I hang with the worshipers. How about the gifts of the Spirit? Same thing. I think I've got it written down here. In, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, in the NLT, love never gives up. Love uh, never loses faith. It's always hopeful. It endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge, which we all love and love to do, I'm not against it. I'm not a cessationist, for goodness sake. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages, special knowledge, will become useless. Whoa. But love lasts forever. It goes on. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. Even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. 
So we apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, we who are using the gifts of, of healing and deliverance, the gifts of knowledge, the, gift, the word of wisdom, guess what? We're temporary help. And we get laid off when perfection comes. But love never fails. Love never goes away. So I'm going to be a worshiper, and I'm going to be a lover. Does that ring a bell? Our high calling, the high calling, is to be conformed to the image of Jesus. It's our number one priority. Everything else we do, everything else we are called to, is secondary and contributory to our high calling. Everything else may consume the bulk of your time, but we have to see it as a secondary thing and stay focused on this one thing. Does that make sense to anybody else? All right, so we know what the high calling is now. Who's it for? Is it just word of life? It's just a certain kind of people that live above 4,500 feet elevation, right? Oh, it's just for European backgrounds. Or it's just for African backgrounds. It's just for Asian backgrounds. It's just for women. It's just for men. God so loved the whole world that he gave his, his beloved son, his only begotten at the time beloved son, the whole world. 2 Peter 3.9, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. This high calling is for the human race. Everybody who is of human species is invited and welcome aboard. He died so that we can all be forgiven our sins if we simply repent and confess our sins before Him, believe and receive Him as our Savior. All humans can do this. Will all humans do it? It's not what the Bible says. One of the great tragedies is that people have the opportunity to get out of the darkness and they choose the darkness. But there's going to be a people who believe and walk in this and fulfill this high calling here on this earth. So who's it for? For everybody. What do we do now? What is our part in this? First of all, it's important to note that we have a part in it. We do have a part in this process. Our part is really small, really tiny, compared to the huge thing God did. And the only reason there's a little bit of us is because he wants us to have a choice. There is no love, there is no love without choice. He's not looking for robots. He's not looking for pets. He's looking for a bride. He's looking for people. So we, we get to choose. That's our tiny little part. Well, he does the big part. But there is a part we have to play. There are things we have to do. I said already in Ephesians 4, their responsibility is perfecting of the saints. It literally says in the NLT, or is it the Message Bible? Where is it? The NLT, their responsibility. We have some responsibility in this. <coughs> Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my beloved, work out your own salvation. It doesn't say work for your own salvation. It says work out your own salvation. He already gave it to you. I like the way Oswald Chambers says. He says, work out what God worked in. And unless God works it in, you ain't got nothing to work out. 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 12, but specifically 5, it says in NLT, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. God makes the promises, but what are we doing? Are we sitting on our blessed assurance and just waiting for God to miracleize it? We have to respond. 
Verse 10 in the New King James. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and your election sure. We got something we got to do. It's really small, but it's important. We have to make the choice. It goes on to say, if you do these things, you will never stumble. Are you guys tired of stumbling? Yeah? Okay. Here's the recipe. Here's the secret sauce right here. Be more diligent to make your calling and election sure. If you do these things, you'll never stumble. And for so, an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The main thing we have to do is belief. What's the main thing we need to do? What's the main thing we need to do? Believe. Because if you don't believe who God has made you to be, all the church in the world ain't going to solve your problems. If you don't believe that He put the life of God within you, then all Pat's little recipes and secret sauces are just that much mess. You've got to believe. These people came up to Jesus in chapter 6 of, of the book of John. What should we do to do the works of God? And He said, these are the works of God. Believe on him whom he hath sent. And what did he say? He said, I will give you a new life. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. That you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. You are my sons. You are my daughters. We can say it. We can quote it in four versions. Do we believe it? Yes, we must purify ourselves. Yes, we must give diligence. But point number two here, you can't, we cannot do this on our own. I've already tried. It doesn't work. Anybody else tried it? You got a few, some of my friends with scar tissue here. Yeah, it, it has a working for you, right? Yeah. That's, that's the beauty of repentance. I get to go, I ain't doing that no more. I'm turning to Jesus. What do we have to do? Point number two, it's critical to know that we cannot do this on our own. Not without Jesus, not without Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, the head, and Christ Jesus, the body. We can't do it on our own. As soon as we think we got it all together, that's when you know you don't. I'll say that again. As soon as you think you've got it all together, that's when you know you don't. That's like someone says, I know exactly when Jesus Christ is coming back. You know he doesn't. (laughs) We have to have Jesus. We have to have the Christ, the head, and the body. This church has saved my life more times than I can count. My friends, my brothers, my sisters, you have been there to give me an encouraging word or kick me in the rear end or whatever I needed. You did. Most of you don't even know it. Yes, we must purify ourselves, but we can't do it on our own strength. It's more a matter of releasing the Christ that's within you than trying to be somebody or something you're not. Did you hear that? It's more a matter of releasing the Christ that is in you than trying to be somebody you're not. It's a matter of knowing and believing who He says you are and releasing that. And what has God said to you who you are? And what has God said to you who you are? Are you releasing that? Last week we discussed being salt and light to this world, right? I don't remember reading, saying, or or reading anything Jesus said that we're supposed to become salt and light. No, he said, be salt and light. He made us salt and light. We're not talking about becoming that. We're talking about manifesting who he already made us. Is this making any sense? We must know that we can't do this not on our own strength. But with Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can do this, and some of us will. And I want to be a part of that, some of us. We 
were made to do this. That's what you were designed for. And like Caleb said, we are well able because of what he did for us. Romans 8, 37. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory should be ours. Should be ours? Overwhelming victory is ours. It's not something we have to hope for. It's something we've been told. It's a fact. Now we need to walk in it. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus. On my own? Oh boy. It's going to be a bad afternoon. But through Christ, I can do this. Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, nor by power, but, nor, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 1 John 4, 4. Thank God he gives us victory over minor things like sin and death. If he can give us a victory over sin and death, how about the bad hair day? How about the blown transmission? How about that boss? How about that employee? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's not just through Christ the head, it's through Christ the body as well, right? All right, over the next several weeks, we're going to discuss this message in serious detail. We're going to we're going to discover a whole bunch of how-tos. We're going to see what the book says on what we can do to, com to complete our little part. But before we do, before we even start on this little venture, I want to declare with no uncertain terms some very specific scriptures, words from God, encouragements. I want to defeat the paralyzing fear of failure before it even rises its stupid and ugly head. Because perfection is what he's calling us to. And the world, and the world of Christianity is telling us, we can't do that. They even wrote a song saying, perfection's my enemy. It's being played on Christian radio. It's ignorance. It's okay. But we're not ignorant. I want to defeat the sense of overwhelming challenges. It should not be. But nobody's ever done this, Pat. What, what are you thinking? How, how can you imagine that somebody's going to be like Jesus or perfect? I believe it because it says it in the Bible. I've been reading dozens of scriptures this, today about it. But nobody's ever done that before. Jesus did. Yeah, but no humans are. Nobody's there in this, that state today. Anybody ever heard of a man named William Seymour? He was the pastor of the church in Azusa Street, 1906. He saw some things in the Bible called the moving and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He saw that people, when they got filled with the Holy Ghost, he didn't see it in reality. He had never seen it before. He read it in the Bible. That people, when they get filled with the Holy Ghost, they speak in this unknown tongue, this unknown language. And he saw it in the Bible. He had never spoken in tongues. He believed it because he saw it in the Bible. He started preaching it. He wasn't even the first person to speak in tongues. But he kept preaching it. And the rest is history. This is a truth in the Bible. Somebody is going to walk in it. Why not us? Fear of failure? This is what Jesus said to that. Luke, write this down. Luke 12, 32. Luke 12, 32. Don't be afraid, little flock. For it gives your father great pleasure, great happiness to give you the kingdom. He wants to give this to you more than you want it. He wants you to have it so much he sent his son to die so you could have it. The Message Bible says it this way. Don't be afraid of missing out. You're my dearest friends. 
The Father wants to give you the very kingdom itself. You know, Satan knows that a lot of us hate failure. And if we think we might fail, a lot of times we don't even start. Or if somebody helps us start and accidentally we find ourselves there, a lot of times we'll sabotage ourselves. God forbid I fail. Come on, everybody, let's do this. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you, he will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We do our little tiny part, and he's going to take care of all the rest of the business. Psalms 138, verse 8, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me, you, us, So let me just close with these final remarks here. He gave it all so we could have it all. So why wouldn't we want it all? He gave it all so we could have it all. Why would we settle for less than all? You're going to run out of money? It's free. All we have to do is choose it. This church has always been a church that wants all that God has for it. We've done some crazy things, just keeping our heart open to get all that God is bringing to us and bringing us to. You know, it's not selfish, it's efficient. You see, it's not wasting what somebody paid dearly to give us. So why wouldn't we want it all? Ignorance? Not anymore. We know what the high calling is, don't we? If you're snoozing a little bit, it's okay. Preaching from one to two is a tough, tough duty here. All that blood sugar's dropped out of your head and people are dozing and drooling. That's why we record it. <laughs> the drooling, that is. See the camera up there? No. We're not ignorant of this anymore. This is what he wants for us. Disqualified? If he qualifies you, who disqualifies you? If God be for us, who can be against us? Because it's really hard, Pat. So is life. Life's hard. So this is hard, at least we get something for it. So go ahead and go out and just let life be hard. What do you end up with? A coffin. But at least if you're living hard here, we got something to gain. We have the high calling to gain. What else do you have to invest your life into? Golf? Shopping? A career? Money? We have the high calling ahead of us. There are a lot of people who are going to settle for less. It doesn't have to be us. Someone's going to believe this. Someone's going to take Jesus up on his word. Why not us? Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. Let's all stand. To be continued next week, but let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, who are we that you bestow such, such word, Lord? We thank you in the name of Jesus for opening the book to us. Lord, we, we're humbled today. Now, Lord, we ask you to open our hearts. Cause us to understand the, the gravity. Cause us to understand what your purposes are in its fullness, Lord. Cause this word to soak deep into our souls. Cause it to be the one thing in our life. Cause that priority to be set in us in the depths of our being, Lord. 
Cause that priority to be the thing that sets our course, the compass upon which we travel. Father, in the name of Jesus, open the book to us. Open our understanding that we can see the fullness. You've called us the word of life, Lord. Help us fulfill that very title to bring forth your life. Lord, go with us this day. Go with us this week. Go with us to fellowship, Lord. Go with us and bring us again to your house that we might lift your, your name in praise, that we might hear and feast off of your word, that we might come together and fellowship one with another. Lord, we ask this and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God.